Hi, everyone. Um, very nice to be here. My name is Julie. Thanks a lot, Ivy, for the opportunity to have this conversation with all of you, with JPEGs. Um, I'm a white woman with long brown hair, brown eyes, I'm in my 30s. I'm wearing a red shirt, headphones, round glasses, and my background is white. Hey everybody, hey Julie, nice to see you again. Uh, I'm Juan Pablo Garcia Sosa, or Juan, Juan Pablo JPEX. I haven't changed so much since I recorded that video, physically at least, uh, only that I'm wearing today a uh, blue jumpsuit and a pinkish pullover, I guess I'm ready to jump into this conversation together with Julie. That's super exciting. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about myself and the work that I've been doing. And I was born and raised in Sao Paulo in Brazil and currently living in Mexico City, which is where I'm uh, speaking with you from. And my background is actually in international relations and gender studies. I have been working at the intersection of the so-called tech for social good field for a few years now. And uh, as uh, Jerome's kind introduction mentioned, I'm currently a fellow with the Mozilla Foundation and I'm developing a new social network, which is called Eureka. Um, and we'll get back to what it means and where the inspiration comes from. But here I'm gonna share my screen with you to illustrate a little bit. And basically Eureka builds upon the features from existing social networks that we all know and a lot of us use. And these features are, for example, user content production, being able to share content, to exchange and chat with other people. Um, but all of that is really designed to lead to meaningful conversations and exchange online, and hopefully to what we call Eureka moments, right? So here you can uh, see on my screen just um, uh, an MVP of the platform actually, which is uh, to be launched in March. Uh, on March 8th this year, so next month. And uh, we have content organized on, under a mosaic that displays different types of works, right? So we have, for example, works from Mexican uh, author from Chiapas called Miguel Ruiz. We have novels from Brazil, uh, from, uh, from Mexico, etc. And one of the main functionalities of Eureka is the possibility to create thematic cycles. So here on my left, on my right, you can see a screenshot of what a thematic cycle looks like. And this is basically a creation of content about a specific topic that any user can make, right? For now, the types of works that are supported by this platform are books and movies, documentaries, and really the goal here is to provide deeper content than just a newspaper article that is read quickly online or just a message on a Facebook group that actually, um, we are talking about content that actually takes more time for you to go through, actually requires you to go offline instead of remaining online uh, all the time. And um, this is just, an overview of the platform itself, we can get back into more details in terms of, of the functionalities. Um, but before we do that, just as I mentioned, going back to that idea of Eureka, right? Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with what the Eureka moment is, or usually what it is traced back to. And uh, the tale that is told about, around the Eureka moment is that it is a moment where Archimedes found what is today known as one of his principles, principles of Archimedes, which is the buoyancy law. And supposedly he was uh, so happy that he found this, uh, the key to this mystery that he got out of his bathtub and ran to the city or the town just screaming um, Eureka, Eka, which is Greek, in Greek means I found it. So it's really related to that, that finding moment, right? Um, and the reason I'm, 
I'm telling you this is because the goal we have at Eureka, the reason why we name it this way, is to constitute an online space that gets people to pause and think, which seems anodyne, but we'll get back to it in terms of what it means uh, in terms of challenging the predominant dynamics we find online and that are dominated by the social media giants. And um, what we really want to do is get people to interact with some deeper content and get them to think and hopefully to have where we're calling an Eureka moment. Cool. Hey, I guess I'll jump in. And I think that's also cool that hey, we kind of ping pong back and forth, like intersecting our projects and visions together, uh, disrupting monologues in a way. Um, I think uh, we, we both share like this fascination to the this click or eureka moment uh, where you feel like a, a energy flowing direct to your brain or something like that. For me, uh, it is very close related to what you will experience in Mexico, possibly in Tepito with this so-called uh, toques. Uh, electroshocks <laughs> machines that you see on the right of that screen and and for me that's kind of uh, this uh, Eureka moment uh, aha moment that that Futura Tropica is also looking for to trigger uh, something that potentially shakes the earth as the mm, very long predicted uh, earthquakes in Bogota or Mexico and on the Andean mountains. Something that puts your world upside down and potentially helps you to, to see things in another perspective by being upside down. Uh, what do you think, Julie? <laughs> I think that's a perfect segue into another point that we have been discussing, right? And that we realized um, is an intersection of our work. So a moment ago, I mentioned that just the fact that to conceive an online space that is meant to have people to pause and think and actually go offline to kind of consume the content that they're supposed to look at is in a way a challenge to the current dynamics of the internet. And here I want to put kind of a, a provocative question uh, on, on the right here, you see on, on the right of this map, there is a screenshot of a list with uh, pictures, headshots and names. Those are the richest people on earth today in this year, 2021. Those are actually all men, uh, mostly white Western men. And the majority of them works in internet in the tech industry and they're representing what we call GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, among others. Um, and, and one of the things I wanted to put here is could we say that those giants of the internet that, that dominate the internet today are our current cultural hegemony? And cultural hegemony is a terminology that I'm borrowing from uh, a Marxist um, philosopher and that really refers to this idea of domination of a culturally diverse society by the ruling class, which manipulates the culture of that society, right? And what if we take the example of some of the big social networks like Facebook that has billions and billions of users and is made, conceived, and mostly uh, managed by white men and women, but mostly white men in Silicon Valley, right? Of course, they have their offices across the world, but there are a series of issues that we have been seeing that arise from the fact that Facebook belongs and was conceived by who it is. For example, in terms of content moderation, right? There is a context that those executives know much better, which is a context of the United States, than other, other countries and other languages. And when they have to choose uh, which words their algorithm are gonna rule off as something that is hate speech or something else, they don't necessarily have the local context, the local knowledge 
to actually make an informed decision about this, right? There are efforts towards this, but the fact is that there have been uh, many instances in which we realize it is a limitation of having a company that is so powerful and that is based in one country and conceived by people from one country. And just an example of how powerful we can consider Facebook is today and, and why I'm using this term of cultural hegemony. I don't know if you saw, but very recently, I believe it was yesterday, um, Facebook blocked Australian users from, being view, from viewing or sharing news in Australia. And that comes as a result of, um, of um, a tentative from the Australian government to actually make Facebook pay for, for showcasing news in their platform. So as a result, they say with a heavy heart, they're blocking the news out of the Facebook platform. So this is Facebook standing up to a country government, basically, and a relatively powerful country government. So this is how much power we can say those, uh, those companies have today. And, and in that sense of what JPEGs and, and I were, were talking about is, you know, there is this hegemony that we've, we've been used to work with, or we've been used to live with, with this uh, hegemony of the very rich countries over everyone else that is not a very rich country, right? And this is also the provocation we wanna put when we, we don't even have the terminology to talk about this, this opposition that for now is conceived as a, a dual opposition, but back a few decades ago was conceived in terms of, of three parts of the world, right? And we had the third world, we have the developing world and we have the developed world. Now we're a little bit more politically correct, so to say, and we say the global north and the global south, but that's also limited in a sense, right? And, and I know JPEGs, a lot of, of, of your thinking is also trying to tackle and propose a, an interesting framework to look at this. Totally, like uh, there's uh, certainly lots of concentrations in certain fields of our realities. Uh, in the fields of knowledge, design, or technologies, uh, they're certainly hegemonic in a way from the way they are conceived and uh, to, where, to, to which it is uh, targeted or, or directed. Um, and uh, this, this has been in, in a way a consequence of most likely of these uh, understandings of the planet we have, as you mentioned, like uh, the, the, the so-called uh, first and third world or develop and developing world. Now the global north and global south or the east and the west or the west and the rest. All these binaries and dualities modern binaries we live in have embedded hierarchies in them. And, and this is something that can, can be, there's an opportunity to, 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 to frame this differently. And, and I think uh, this flipping the map, uh, the way we, are, we have learned to see the planet and to relate to the planet and put it upside down uh, might be a, a beginning for this. Um, as 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 uh, potentially also relating to the way how the 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 magnetic fields of the North Pole have been shifting from Canada to Siberia and they're tending to the south. Uh, this is where I I think. It's a good moment to, to introduce what uh, I suggest as an option uh, with the idea of the tropics and the tropical belt. Um, like come to terms to this idea of a region that has historically been undervalued, exploited and over and see how uh, within this tropical belt or this idea of the um, tropical turn playing with the etymology of the word tropics and in ancient Greek also coming back to the means to turn, referring to when the sun turns the other way around in the solstice, in the tropics of uh, Cancer in the north and Africa in the south. Um, 
by thinking of uh, the idea of the tropical belt and extending this understanding of how he as a Colombia not only relate to the Latin American continent, but also relate very well to someone in, in Kenya or Cameroon, the African continent or Vietnam, Cambodia, because all of these climates and environments and landscapes we share, uh, there's an opportunity to bring this to these equations of East, East West, North, South um, binaries we have and open up the space for for all the margins uh, that stay uh, in between these uh, black and white polarities, no? Um, um, what do you think about uh, this, this opportunity? Yeah, definitely. And, and as, uh, as we've been discussing, I think this is, this is really an interesting way of, of breaking the binaries, as you were saying, and potentially of, of fostering more local knowledge, right? Because at the end, we are, the reason why we want to conceive this world, our world, in a non-binary, non-global north, first world dominated manner, is because there is so much value and so much knowledge in the so-called rest of the world, right? And yeah. that idea of bringing the, the tropics, the tropicos, is, is breaking this, this binary and say, well, we don't define ourselves anymore just in opposition, right? We exist. I think this idea of uh, sure, uh, looking at local knowledges and how we define it on our own terms uh, undoubtedly in, in, in a way, so to say, uh, I think that's uh, very relevant, especially with the cloud of globalism is so pervasive in a way uh, and see how, 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 what there could be if, if we look at local responses yet with a planetary or intertropical conscious and and I think this is something that we 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 both share this this uh, mm -hmm. interest on on local news. In 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 my case, uh, I'm I'm beginning this network connecting communities of affection or networks of affection and support in Kinshasa, the Air Congo, Bengaluru, India, and Bogota, Colombia, and. Uh, examining like responses to both our natural and artificial environments and see how we can like, develop an intertropical conversation with them. Um, I think also uh, coming back to, to the proposals of Eureka, uh, it's interesting how you can create content, also not, not, not only books, like the traditional idea of what knowledge is, no? For instance, we have in the Spanish this word saberes, uh, that uh, in English it maybe isn't there. And that's why I purposefully say knowledge is in plural, uh, going against a grammar. Uh, because there are other forms that have been uh, disregarded and visualized then. And, and I think that's, that's interesting how, how uh, in Eureka there's this exploration of other media or other literacy not only through what uh, is written in the books or what we can uh, rewrite or rescript uh, in them. As far yeah, as and that's... USB sticks, <laughs> just to finish with that. <laughs> no, that, you're, you're totally right. And, and that's, that's one of the premises actually. And we're starting with books and movies and documentaries um, this is a very specific type of content. Hopefully further ahead, we can expand to other types of content too. For example, in Latin America, one fundamental vector of, of culture, of knowledge, of, of thinking about society are telenovelas, right? They're hugely popular. They are watched by millions, potentially <laughs> they're across all uh, social classes, uh, often across gender and, 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 and other aspects that, that usually 
create those subgroups of population, right? And there's a lot of knowledge that is, or as you say, saberes, that are embedded in, in those uh, telenovelas. Sometimes they're very <laughs> caricatural, <laughs> but they have been making efforts and they are a means of communication that is accessed by people, right? And, and that's uh, one of the key aspects of how yeah. to reach people. <laughs> I think that's uh, super interesting that you brought that uh, to, to the table, uh, considering that Colombia makes proud of exporting many telenovelas and we, we have these dynamics of uh, like broadcasting telenovelas audio in radio programs. So you could watch the telenovela outside of a bakery or a shop if you didn't, you don't, you don't have a TV, so you can go uh, somewhere. <laughs> uh, And this is something that is particularly interesting uh, in, in the Futura Tropica project, like how, how can, can we engage in street level uh, with, uh, like <laughs> with, with a big amount of the population, no? Uh, like get all rid of all this uh, jargon from academia and technology and And touch uh, people to some extent with these uh, cultural imaginaries, uh, that group of cultural imaginaries that are uh, present collectively in, in our minds and our aspirations and dreams. You know? um, I think that, that, that's very interesting to explore also, like considering how they are being shared now in WhatsApp series or telenovelas or, or in India with morning messages that break the internet. But, but never mind, let's, let's go again to, to But what, what do you actually think of like um, formats as well? Like, uh, so Eureka, Eureka is, a, is a website. Uh, so from what I get. And, mm -hmm. and so people will 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 have access to this database or this uh, library or um, how you call that la 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 cena the spice, a spice yeah. library uh -huh. <laughs> the, the grocery exactly exactly the grocery thing um, what are the forms we could think of like uh, that are already present actually in in our realities in, in Brazil or in Mexico or all yeah. the way to the Vietnam. Yeah, that's, that's a great point because we know the limitations of the web, right? And especially the web that is accessed through a computer. In many parts of the world, um, the primary means to access the internet is a cell phone, actually, right? Which usually is cheaper and therefore is more widespread. So a very basic um, and initial answer is we're starting with desktop for, you know, resource reasons, etc. But there's already a mobile version of the platform that is designed. And that as soon as we get the resources, we're going to be implementing based on that premise, right? That we know that talking about people that have access to the internet and have the digital literacy to have access to those to this content is already uh, reducing our potential audience, right? And people that mm. could benefit from this because we know not everybody has access to the internet or is digital, digital literate. But that's how we're starting. And um, definitely I had, actually one of the inspirations of Eureka is the book clubs, right? That, a lot of people that I know um, in, in my circle participate in book clubs and get a lot out of this. And those book clubs have very different formats and they can actually be assimilated to gatherings of people that are interested about a similar topic, a topic that transcends their rea reality, their society, that want to exchange about others and start building this collective knowledge that hopefully can lead to an Eureka moment can be to seeing the world a little bit differently, right? And mm -hmm. the aspect of being able to exchange with others is also fundamental. So of course, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Some countries are still under full lockdown. So this comes with a lot of restrictions in terms of what 
we can do in the near future. Um, yeah. We're starting with the digital platform, but further ahead, maybe it could be an excuse for also people to have more in-person meetings, right? And and asked around this idea of, okay, we, we want to understand better our own reality. We want to give more visibility to the, the knowledge and, and the contents that we know exist because right there are other types of content than books and movies. But even if you take yeah. books and movies, for example, um, there is also a lot of asymmetry between the type of content that people usually access, right? Um, I make this exercise like myself on a personal level that I uh, really try to read when I, let's say I read 15 books in a year, I really try to choose books also that come from non-white Western uh, authors to have diversity mm. in my own reading. And mm. having making that effort um, consciously, right? I still end up at the end of the year with like a 50-50 kind of, of ratio between uh, white authors, non-white authors and male authors and female authors. So this is just to say that in general, there is much more space that is given to certain types of author, directors of movies, documentaries, etc. One of the things I'm hoping to do with Eureka is also to break this a little bit, even in terms and technical terms, having an algorithm that promotes and uh, more like the diverse, but and word that is not great um, content, right? So it, it will offer you more content. For example, a book like Miquel Ruiz, which is an author from Chiapas that I was lucky to found in a library when I was in Chiapas, but I never found elsewhere. So, so just to give an example. Um, wow. So we're happy, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just... Uh, uh, I'm not the one to say this, but I think we are running out of time, unfortunately. Oh. But uh, <laughs> talking in the video conference lounge, uh, just mm -hmm. wanted to to pinpoint quickly to the the club back uh, mm -hmm. uh, vision. I think it's 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 super interesting. What if it would be like a a, a cookbook or a fajada jam that already it's it happens mm -hmm. in, in in Brazil? For instance, um, what if we could think of these books or content or videos as recipes? Uh, that's that's many things, many 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 ideas popping up, and, and yeah, just uh, to close, uh, just want to to acknowledge. Uh, and thank all the people involved in the Futura Tropica project, over 40 people that Futurita, Futura Tropica touch uh, to a certain extent. Uh, I'm very happy about this, uh, both the physical distribution possibilities and uh, the, the intertropical private local network um, for this lateral flow of knowledge. Science and technologies. Um, thanks, Julie. Uh, I don't know if someone is coming in to, to close this, but uh, I guess we just say goodbye or something like that. <laughs>